everyone for joining us again. I apologize, we had a little bit of a, a technical difficulty there, but I believe we're back. Uh, my name is Jeff Slegemelch. I'm the Deputy Director here at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University's Earth Institute. I'm also the Project Director of the Resilient Children and Resilient Communities Initiative. And as part of that initiative, we're bringing you today this webinar on the Shoreline Project and how to engage youth to help build disaster resilience within your communities. Uh, for those who don't know, the Resilient Children Resilient Communities Initiative is a three-year partnership with the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University and Save the Children, funded under a three-year grant from GSK. Uh, this project is focused on increasing the resilience of institutions that serve children uh, every day and uh, within the communities and also tying that into uh, a more national approach on how do we, how do we empower communities to, to better prepare for the unique needs of children in a disaster. Um, I know some of you today are joining us from our community resilience coalitions in Washington County, Arkansas and Putnam County, New York. Welcome, great to see you today. And for those of you who are joining us who aren't from those two communities, but if you're interested in learning more about the initiative, uh, you can go to the website at ncdp.columbia.edu forward slash rcrc. And then you can track the progress, you can hear stories from the communities, you can see an overview of the project, you, and access resources like this webinar as we accumulate them over the course of the project. But what I'd like to do now is hand it over to Dr. David Abramson. Dr. Abramson is the founder of the Shoreline Youth Empowerment Program. He's a clinical associate professor and the director of the program on Population Impact Recovery and Resilience, or Pi R Squared, at NYU. He's led numerous studies on community recovery, looking really at the family and the household level for Hurricane Katrina, the Gulf oil spill, Superstorm Sandy, among many others. Uh, on this project, he's also a member of our National Children's Resilience Leadership Board, really helping to support the work of the community resilience coalitions and helping to bring that work uh, into the national dialogue. So with that, I'll hand it over. David, thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. She was uh, very excited about uh, the project that we were thinking about at the time, the Shoreline project that you're about to hear. Uh, and she said, I would love to work with you in any way that I could. Uh, she said that she was about to become a communications major at Louisiana State University. And she, in fact, became our video documentarian. So some of the videos that you're going to see sprinkled throughout the presentation today are all courtesy of Maria Doe. <clears throat> Excuse me, Maria Doe. So I'd like to talk to you about short Last time we met up with the Shoreliners, we challenged each chapter to develop their own disaster-related projects. And one school year later, we're here. And the award for the best capstone project goes to... But before we announce the winners, we'll show you how the students got to this point. In those seven school months, the Shoreliners utilized project-based learning to develop their projects and to solve real-world problems. Instead of the classroom setting, the Shoreliners got a hands-on learning experience developing their own disaster-related projects. Projects that would prepare their communities for disasters. That's no textbooks, no tests, and no stiff wooden desks. Instead, they acquired the skills needed to make an achievable, sustainable, feasible, exportable, and scalable project. Last time we met up with the Shoreliners, we challenged each chapter to develop their own disaster-related projects. And one school year later, we're here. And the award for the best capstone project goes to... But before we announce the winners, we'll show you how the students got to this point. In those seven school months, 
the Shoreliners utilize project-based learning to develop their projects and to solve real-world problems. Instead of the classroom setting, the Shoreliners got a hands-on learning experience developing their own disaster-related projects. Projects that would prepare their communities for disaster. So I'd like to go back actually a couple of years before Shoreline begin, began. Uh, and to give you a little bit of a sense of what was the research that led to the specific resilience uh, ways that disasters affect kids. Number one is that there are often enduring impacts on children and youth that extend well beyond the time of the event itself. And we saw that again and again across many different types of disaster events, whether man-made or technological or natural hazard. The second uh, is that children are incredibly dependent upon support systems in their lives. This is the children as bellwethers ar uh, argument that uh, in order to really understand how children are affected by disasters and, and how they fit into a larger scheme, you want to know what are all of the systems in their lives, the parental systems, the household systems, the school systems, community systems, all of which have to be operating optimally in order for children to thrive. And lastly, something that uh, really became more and more evident to us was that children want to have a voice. They want to be empowered. They want to be engaged in their own preparedness and in their recovery. Uh, so in 2012, uh, with funding from the Baton Rouge Area Foundation, we began to really focus on how to develop the Shoreline Project. And we did this in, uh, in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And we began with a uh, household survey across four Gulf Coast states from Florida to Louisiana. We also did a series of focus groups in many of the communities along those four states, and we were exploring models of youth resilience in particular. So when we did the focus groups, we spoke with youth, we spoke with parents. You could see on the slide all of the people that we talked to in five different communities across the four states. And in each of these uh, communities, we would take the, um, the results from our uh, household survey, where we had uh, surveyed over 1,400 households with children across those four states, and we asked them, what's the story behind the numbers that we're looking at? And we heard all sorts of meaningful uh, input from them. Number one, that it wasn't just about the oil spill, it was about Katrina as well, that the chronic stressors, that the acute stressors that uh, the children were experiencing were layered upon the chronic stressors such as poverty uh, in their lives. Uh, sometimes there was also a lack of health care access. Uh, the economy was uh, problematic. Uh, parents were very concerned that there was a way of life that was disappearing and that it was hard to really give the kids a sense of what a future might look like. In one fishing community in particular, we found out that there were 90 teenage pregnant girls in the high school, uh, approximately at a rate of one in 11 girls. And one of the things we heard was uh, one of the community stakeholders who said, the only thing to do around here is go fishing, get higher, get pregnant, and you can't uh, go fishing anymore after the oil spill. And Dr. Peek and I felt that we had a responsibility when we heard all of this to really um, help the communities understand what the connections were, but also we wanted to compel action. And so we were looking at the question of what do we need to know about resilience to make the children at this place in the Gulf Coast more resilient? And there are two basic ways of thinking about resilience. One would be uh, where you want to do it before the event and you want to promote development in children so that they are more adaptable, they've developed skills, they're better at expressing emotions, forming relationships. You do this before the event occurs. The second one, what you see here in circle B, would be symptom-based, where it's after the event and you're trying to think about, okay, how can we decrease the psychological symptoms? Um, how can we help children who have experienced, children or youth, uh, who have experienced these kind of traumatic events make meaning of their, um, their experiences. 
in addition to this, we looked at a number of ways of activating children's resilience. Uh, and we did this as part of uh, an Institute of Medicine uh, project where we looked across uh, a number of years of resilience projects. We saw the ways that people had tried in the past to enhance uh, youth resilience in a variety of ways. It could have been through policy decisions, policy advocacy, uh, through child care task forces. This is something that Save the Children in particular has taken a lead on. Uh, and in particular, though, through programs and interventions that are specific for children. And that's the one that we decided we were going to focus on. The other thing that we did is we went through the resilience literature, which mainly grew out of uh, the psychological literature over the last 30 years. And there is something in the resilience literature about children that refers to the short list of the key aspects or characteristics uh, of children's lives that will promote resilience. And you can see here some of, the, um, some of these characteristics, that you want children who can be self-efficacious, have a good sense of self-esteem and their own self-worth. Um, have the ability to activate their executive control where they, they are practiced in being able to, to take charge of their lives in many ways, that they've gained coping skills, that they feel that there are important adult relationships in their lives or other supportive relationships, that they have an opportunity for what's called pro-social behavior. And this is where when we first heard directly from uh, the youth that they wanted to help others, it wasn't so much that they wanted to talk about themselves, but they wanted to think about if they've gone through an event like this, how can they help others do so? Um, other aspects that were really critical in this short list is children who had a positive world view. And however that came about, that could come about sometimes through faith communities through a sense of community or communal solidarity. When, they, when youth in particular have an opportunity to make meaning of things and understand a world that is larger than their own experiences, they tend to do better. And the bottom line across all of these is that what you want to do is provide stability. Stability at a parental level, a household level, institutional levels, whether that's schools, daycare centers, hospitals, health systems, all of the various institutions that children and youth come into contact with. And you want to, in general, routinize and stabilize the social routines in children's lives. And so we took all of these things together, all of the programmatic work that we had heard about and learned about, this resilience shortlist, and we created Shoreline. And so the SHORE in SHORELINE stands for the following, skills, hopes, opportunities, resilience through engagement. And what you see here are the key aspects that are associated with each one of these facets of the SHORELINE project. So with skills, we wanted to build a program where the youth would be able to really have a chance to exercise and enhance all of the various skills that, we're, that you see here. Critical thinking, leadership, communication, organization, time management, project management, um, all of which will build a sense of self-efficacy, something we'll come back to. We wanted to give the youth hope. We wanted to be able to not only broaden their worldview, but give them a sense for an appreciation for the diversity that is uh, beyond just the realm of their own community. We wanted to give them very tangible opportunities. And so we wanted this Shoreline project to be a platform for those participating youth to give them a chance to be innovative, to be creative, to broaden their own personal networks. And those networks could extend to other youth and other communities to people within their own communities, in particular community leaders, um, to really inspiring uh, advocates within their communities. And all of this was done in order to advance the youth's resilience. So by doing all of these things, we were, we were hoping to build their coping skills, self-efficacy, and do this through the pro-social behavior. The key mechanism for all of this was engagement. We wanted the youth to engage with each other in their schools, across their school, with their communities, and with community leaders, with the people that, uh, that we had on our Shoreline staff at, uh, 
initially at Columbia University, then at New York University, at Colorado State University, and with the Youth Advisory and National Advisory Board members that we have as part of Shoreline. And when we looked at what models might inspire us, we actually found three in particular that uh, we found to be very helpful for us. One was the Posse Project, which has been around for 25 years at this point, uh, and which really helped us understand what the power of groups was. This is a, a uh, foundation-led effort to identify youth in high schools and then create a cohort of 10 of them from an area and follow them and bring them to a specific university seti setting where they go through it together. So they learn to rely upon one another. Again, it was the power of groups. And then across all of the universities that these posses exist, at, exist within, the power of groups of groups. The other thing that we looked at, uh, which we found incredibly inspirational, was in Philadelphia, a high school that was running something called the Sustainability Workshop, which initially was dedicated to just high school seniors, where they spent the entire senior year doing project-based learning. They've since turned that into a, a high school, 9 through 12, whose entire curriculum is built around this notion of project-based learning. And then lastly, we looked at the Rockaway Youth Task Force, which had existed prior to Hurricane Sandy uh, and had been very engaged in economic development and, and advocacy for youth to be, become involved more broadly in community service. And then after Sandy, proved to be an incredible model for what youth advocacy and mobilization could look like. So we took all of these together to try and create Shoreline. And our vision for Shoreline was that we wanted to develop a network of youth who help themselves, their families, their schools, their communities, and youth in other communities prepare for and recover from disaster. And our mission was twofold. Number one, to create this network of youth that gives them the chance to make powerful connections. And number two, as embodied in the name of the program itself, we wanted to, uh, let me just go back to that, we wanted to develop the skills, foster hope, and capitalize on opportunities to help them prepare and recover. So here are the core elements of the Shoreline Project. It's, it's really built around a curriculum and it starts with a teacher orientation. The program itself is rather adaptable and it could be delivered as either a class or a club. So it could be curricular embedded within a high school, and we've run it now in multiple high schools, um, many in the Gulf, and now we're operating in New York City public high schools as well. Um, and some of these are running within the curriculum. For example, one New York City school we're working with now is using this as their 12th grade curriculum for an emergency management class that all students are taking. In other schools, they've managed to use this as a curriculum that could cut across all the grades and other models would be as an after-school club. Uh, throughout all of this, there is a curriculum that all, uh, all of the chapters can follow, and the aspects of it are really twofold. There's a didactic aspect and a project-based aspect, and we'll go into this in a moment. The culmination of all of this is that the students develop a capstone project. The first thing they do is they try and uh, identify a problem. And once they've gotten the problem well articulated, uh, that is a problem that can affect the community uh, either before uh, in terms of what they need to do to prepare or in terms of response to recovery, once they've clearly articulated the problem, then they begin thinking about what's, in, what's a creative solution to that problem. And they spend the academic year working on that project that you, as you will hear about in a moment. At the end of the year, the students from around uh, the Shoreline Network come to a capstone summit. They present their capstone projects to one another and to a panel of judges, and from that, they gain a project certification. And let's take a look more specifically at the curriculum itself. And so here are not all of the aspects of the curriculum, but some of the key ones that I really wanted to be sure to highlight uh, for you today. The first, and you can see as we go through, the first is really a need to establish, establish a shoreline chapter, and this exists before you've even gotten any students, and we'll, we'll go into detail about each aspect of these things. Then you want to get into the team building aspect of building the chapter, 
developing the skills, having the youth learn about what it means to be empowered. You could see here number five is the didactic aspect where we use disasters as case studies. And there's something about disasters that is actually very compelling to youth. Um, we have began this project in communities that were hard hit by disasters along the Gulf Coast and then in New York City after Hurricane Sandy. But the reality as we've begun to learn it is the Shoreline Project can work anywhere. It can work anywhere where youth want to be engaged in helping their communities, want to be thinking about broader challenges to themselves, to their communities, and to the world around them. And disasters are just very compelling. They're dramatic. They give a chance for youth to be grappling with what are known as wicked problems. Wicked because they are very hard to solve. Um, and it's the kind of thing that lets them to be creative and innovative. And then in the curriculum, we move through creating the Shoreline Project, the summit, and an evaluation component. So let's take a look at what a typical shoreline year could be. And this is at the point that we are trying to develop a shoreline chapter. So if you're at the point of saying, well, we're even thinking about it, here are the kinds of things that you'd want to be thinking about in terms of the academic year, the timeline, how things would unfold, in what order, and how you might structure this kind of a shoreline project in your school, in your area, in your community. So um, on the left side of the screen, you would see those core aspects, those modules and activities that could occur and would occur in any shoreline chapter, whether it was a club or an, an intracurricular piece of the high school day. Uh, in the, on the right side of the screen, you see the more didactic aspects, and we're, we'll go over this in a little bit of detail in a minute. And so the part on the, the right with the disaster studies would not necessarily be done if you were only running a club. If, however, you are running a full-fledged class, that's a shoreline class, you would have all of these uh, pieces of didactic material. And as part of the shoreline curriculum that we've developed, you would have lesson plans. Um, you would have lots of material and resources from which to draw to run the, um, the didactic aspect, as well as to run the project-based modules and activities. The beginning of a chapter, the early days in a chapter, are really spent team building, having the youth become comfortable with working in groups and, and beginning to dip their toe in project-based learning. And we begin with two modules in particular, the Who Am I and the Who Are We modules. The Who Am I is not done as a group. It's done as a solo project, but it gives the youth the chance to begin to think about um, how can they find things in their life and speak about them and articulate that? We ask them to find um, an artifact, a photo, an object, and then to present that to the rest of the class as a way of describing who they are. And then we ask them to broaden that and operate and work in a team and say, who are we? Who is our community? What is our strength? If, we are, if our community has many different aspects within the community, what's our sub-community? What's our block? What's our neighborhood? Where do we belong? What are the weaknesses, but what are the strengths that are displayed in that community? Then we do a number of team building exercises and also uh, go through the True Colors Assessment, which is essentially a psychological uh, assessment tool so that the youth have a chance to see what are their personal strengths and what are their attributes as they think about how they're going to work together as teams. The kind of skills that we want them to develop right away is we want them to think about how do you think creatively? How do you define a problem? And so some of the early modules and early activities really focus um, on these kind of activities. And so the students are working together. They're using things such as photo voice and video voice, which are, are both um, strategies for using technology to, to bring in the outside world and help them illustrate and, uh, and develop uh, answers to these kinds of uh, activities. And throughout all of this, we want them to be thinking about partnerships that they could develop as well. And this means partnerships with community groups. 
So it's not just that they're looking at building the teams within their chapter. We want them to be looking outside of their school at the, the strength of the community and at legitimate community partners that they could engage. When we get to the didactic aspect, you could see here a sampling of some of the case studies that we've developed. We don't anticipate that uh, any given school is going to do all of these case studies, but they have all of the material available to them. Each one of these case studies has um, a brief lesson plan. Uh, it has the, the narrative material. It has links to videos. It has discussion questions to stimulate classroom discussion. And each one is picking something different, another aspect of a disaster, so that all of, when the students have a chance to go through this, they're now beginning to learn uh, through the lens of a disaster things that may be sociological, political, economic, cultural, about prior disasters that have happened. Um, this begins to a little bit more of a grounding in what it means when a community has gone through one of these major disasters. We can begin to think about what kind of problems do we want to address as a team, as a chapter, as a shoreline group. And when it comes time to developing the shoreline project, we think of it just as a research and development pipeline. And so what you see here is the full scale of a pipeline for those shoreline projects, their capstone projects. It begins with a concept where they have to come up with a clearly articulated problem and come up with a solution that addresses that problem. That's the concept. The proof of concept is once they begin developing an actionable project, something that they're literally doing in their community. And we'll see a couple of illustrations for this in a minute. After they've done the proof of concept, which means that they can literally create this project, it is achievable, it is feasible. Um, they begin to evaluate it and refine it. Because the thing that we want to get the shoreline chapters to is, is it possible to scale up your project, scale it up so it goes beyond just your school, just beyond your chapter? Can you scale it up to your community? Could you scale it up beyond your community? And are all the pieces together so that it could be exported outside your community? At the end of the, the project year, when we have the Capstone Summit, we have a certification process. And for each element of this pipeline, we will essentially have the judges review the chapter's presentations, review their projects, and give them um, a certification that corresponds with where they are, however far they've gotten. Sometimes the chapters will not, in fact, it has yet to happen that any given chapter has gotten all the way to ready for export in one year. Um, many times they carry over their projects into multiple years. And so it may take two to three years before a shoreline school and or chapter will get a project where that's fully developed, refined, evaluated, ready to be scaled up, and ready for export. When a school or a chapter has gotten a project that has um, met the criteria for the concept phase, we give them copper certification. When they've achieved the proof of concept, they get bronze certification. When they've evaluated and refined their project, they get silver certification. When they've scaled it up and they've met the criteria for scaling up a project, they get gold certification. And when they've gotten a project all the way ready for export and it is, it is completely ready to go as like a project in a box that can be handed over to another community, they get platinum certification. To date, we've had one school get all the way through to platinum certification. The teams themselves, the students, will often arrange themselves within teams within their chapter, depending on what they're doing and what their project is. So here's an illustration of the type of subgroups they will create when they are developing their project. They'll create a design subgroup, a build, a management team, a communication team, a, logist a logistics team. And so this may, as you may think of a shoreline chapter as being anywhere between 8 and 16 youth, although we've had many that are a lot larger and they can break into any number of teams. But if you had a team of 8 to 16, you can imagine that they could create these little subgroups within to manage their project. And that's part of what they're learning, is how to 
operate on their own without a lot of adult intervention, but how to work their way through these problems of running a team, organizing themselves, and achieving a solution that they can present at a national summit. So let's look at a couple of the problems that some of the Shoreline chapters have come up with over the years. So here's one. The problem was that the emotional aftermath of a disaster can be a difficult time for adults, youth, and children. Young children exposed to a disaster are often unable to articulate their feelings. And so the solution, the, the, the youth first came up with this problem statement, and then the solution that they created was a program called Artsy, which is a program in which the teens were working with younger children to run essentially an art relief, almost a therapy program, um, where the high schoolers took this to uh, an elementary school in their community. They tried it out, they evaluated it, they refined it, and then they got to the point of being ready to export it. And this occurred at Ben Franklin High School in New Orleans. Another problem. The time demands on parents and caregivers after a disaster often mean that children need guidance, attention, knowledge, and skill build building activities in which to be engaged. And so the Gulfport, Mississippi chapter came up with a project called Camp Hope Waves, which could be deployed in a shelter setting after an event or in a community-based setting after a disaster. And they incorporated um, the skill building aspect of building an aquaponics project within this uh, shelter or in a community-based setting to help the children learn how they can create a self-sustaining ecosystem uh, with very few uh, resources. Another problem that one of the communities came up with, one of the Shoreline chapters, was that high-risk communities are often not adequately prepared for a disaster. And so in South Lafourche, uh, Louisiana, the shoreline chapter there came up with T, Teens Enhancing Awareness. And what they did was they combined preparedness activities with post-disaster community service. So they, they built um, the skills that they needed to provide the kind of help. They did a resource inventory of what they had. They inventoried the community to find out what would be needed. And then they were ready in the event of a disaster to go and deploy themselves within the community to help do whatever might be needed. Uh, lastly, as an illustration, post-disaster settings in which communities have lost stable power supply often lead to difficulties preparing and cooking nutritious foods. And so for this one, Alma Bryant High School chapter, and they did this one over a number of years, created the powerless uh, kitchen, essentially. They started out with uh, the No Power, No Problem project, Cooking Without Power, and they, they designed, essentially, um, a cook stove that could be built out of cardboard boxes, aluminum foil, uh, and readily available power supply, such as uh, charcoal briquettes or biomass fuel options. Um, they took this and they expanded it to the community. They had a cooking without power cook-off in their community to encourage preparedness um, and encourage also a focus on nutrition at the same time. And so for all of these things, when, the, when we're looking at this, we're thinking about is the solution that the, the youth are coming up with, is it feasible, is it achievab achievable, and is it exportable? So let's listen to a, a little snippet of a video from the Ben Franklin High School in New Orleans describe their project. Franklin created an art therapy program for youth in the aftermath of disasters. Their network was achievable through local elementary schools. After any kind of disaster, children can feel really stressed out and um, basically not like they're safe in their communities anymore. So we're hoping by like targeting that stress and helping to mitigate it, that um, we can help the, these children who have been affected negatively by the disasters to feel better. Draw what you think of when you think of your family. It doesn't necessarily have to be people. It can be your home, what you view as your home, what makes you feel safe sort of thing. I just think it's so important that you took, you pulled from personal experience and decided to use that personal experience to make an impact. And then you came up here as one of the youngest groups and had everything together. You thought about all the details 
you thought about what you needed before you even implemented it. And like I said, you're way more prepared than I was when I first started Art Feeds. So the, sh the Shoreline chapter in Ben Franklin that you just heard about, the Artsy Project, was the one chapter that has achieved a platinum certification. And here's how good they got to in terms of the exportability of their project. On their own, without any engagement or involvement of any adults or teachers, but just as their own group, they decided that uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago, uh, to reach out independently to Flint, Michigan. And they got through to the superintendent of schools in Flint and offered to the superintendent directly to send their artsy program, thinking that maybe the students in Flint, Michigan would be interested in this kind of an, an effort as well. Um, I think that is probably still uh, under development. If that's going to happen, we don't know. But just the fact that they were able to have all of it ready with videos that described what they were doing, <clears throat> a curriculum, an evaluated project ready to hand over was an incredible testament to what youth can do uh, when they're given this kind of an opportunity. And so we've run these capstone summits for, we've had three of them to date. Each time we do it at a university-based setting because we'd like to engage youth and make them see the, the values of being uh, on a, at a university campus and, and feel the, the university sitting around them. And you could see where we've held them in the past. Uh, Loyola, University of New Orleans, and this year will be at New York University. The other thing that we've been doing is we've been evaluating shoreline. So for example, this is looking at the question of how have skills changed? And so in our baseline year, we did a pre and a post test where we had the shoreline cases and we asked them to recruit 150 controls who were like them. And we surveyed them at the beginning and at the end of the school year. And we did find out something a little bit surprising for what we did not really expect. This is what you see here is the hypothetical of what we were hoping to see, that the cases would increase on any one of those sort of skill levels that are illustrated above it, that they would increase in critical thinking skills, analytical, communication, or leadership skills. And here are the numbers of what actually uh, transpired. So you can see that we were looking at six skills in particular, the critical thinking, communication, analytical abilities, collaboration, organizational skills, and leadership. Each one of these columns represents a different thing we were testing. The first column that says pre-intervention is essentially testing whether or not there was a difference between the case group and the control group, whether the shoreline students look different than non-shoreliners. And what we found is they do. They essentially selected themselves into shoreline in part uh, the way they look different is they were more likely to have better communication or self-rate their own communication skills and also feel like they were more collaborative than the non-shoreliners. The middle column is for everybody, the cases and controls, shoreliners and non-shoreliners alike. And what this illustrates and was surprising to us is that essentially on average all students rank themselves lower at the end of the year than at the beginning of the year on all of these aspects. It could be that the students become more self-critical, uh, maybe they have a greater, greater understanding of what the skills might take, but all of them were essentially showing a downward slope on average. And then in the third column, you see what the effect is of being a shoreliner who participated throughout the whole year. And it's essentially that Shoreline was offering a counterbalance to what was otherwise this negative or downward slope. So on three skills in particular, we found statistically significant improvement amongst the Shoreliners in critical thinking, analytical abilities, and leadership. Uh, I'd actually like you to hear a little bit from what Shoreline teachers have to say about their students. So let's listen to the teachers speak about their students. Shoreline is a project that wants to empower students or young people. So how does it make me different? I don't go into the meetings with them and say, this is what we're doing. I say to the students, 
where are you? What are you working on? What issues do you see with our project or with whatever we're doing? What is really invigorating and motivating about Shoreline is watching my students develop leadership skills and watching them get to know themselves and believe in themselves, like develop self-confidence. It's super exciting and, and inspiring. So if after having seen this webinar, you're interested in finding out more or you're thinking about maybe deploying and or employing Shoreline in your community, here are really some of the things, the very specific steps that are involved in creating a Shoreline chapter. Number one, obviously, is finding a willing school partner, a principal and somebody who is going to be the teacher advisor for that Shoreline chapter. Uh, to date, we've only operated Shoreline in school settings. We have not done so in community-based settings or community-based organizations. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't entertain that possibility, but to date, we have not done that. The second step is to figure out what kind of model do you want to run for Shoreline? Do you want it to be uh, curricular or extracurricular, class or club? Number three is we would want you to uh, have the teachers join one of our teacher orientations, which occur in the summertime prior to the school year beginning. Number four, then, is actually implementing Shoreline for an academic year, either as a club or a class, and participating in a Shoreline evaluation. Number five would be to send a Shoreline chapter or team to the Capstone Summit at the end of the academic year in May or June. So for example, if you ended up having running this uh, as we're doing right now with one class of about 90 students taking it, they may have four or five shoreline teams and they will decide which one of them they want to send to the summit. They may even end up sending multiple teams to the summit. And lastly, for more information about this, I would invite you to contact either me or my co-founder, co-director, Dr. Lori Peek, and our, um, our emails are at the end of this presentation. So this is what uh, some of our shoreliners look like when they're actually on a shoreline in the Gulf Coast. Uh, and uh, I uh, thank you very much for the time and the opportunity to present this. And here are our email addresses if you wanted to reach us. Great, thank you, David. Thank you so much for walking us through this and sharing this with the communities and folks who are engaging with this project. Um, I think just talking a little bit more uh, about uh, sort of the, our communities, I know you're familiar with this project and familiar with the different kinds of groups involved. So you mentioned previously that the, you've predominantly done this in school settings. Has mm -hmm. it always been high school settings that it's been done in? Uh, it always has been high school settings because we felt that there was a certain level of development and maturity that sure. would be required for the youth to be able to do a lot of this. But interestingly, we've had interest from middle schools, middle school principals who have approached us and said, yeah. you know, would we entertain the possibility of a shoreline chapter in a middle school? And I think it could work particularly well if it's paired perhaps with a high school club as well and maybe have the high schoolers be okay. mentors to the middle schoolers. Um, we're, we're at a point that, you know, we're happy to see this model <laughs> expand wherever and however sure. it would be, and uh, it's quite adaptable. Sure. You know, my daughter is 10, and if she sees this and finds out that she can make an oven with a cardboard box and some tin foil, then, well, we have a weekend project. Um, exactly. And possibly the need for a fire extinguisher. <laughs> that has more to do with her father than her. But uh, with, um, so uh, we have a lot of groups involved in Washington County and Putnam County that are after school programs or summer camps or, or, or camps for, for uh, various kinds of youth. Mm -hmm. um, how would you see this program possibly fitting in with that? Uh, I, actually, Lori and I have talked about this and we think it could fit in very well. I think that it, it requires um, an engagement and really a commitment from that community-based organization, whether it's a, it's a camp or, uh, you know, whatever, a boys club, girls club, mm -hmm. um, they, they would and could be natural partners yes. for this kind of activity. Uh, a Y could be as well. 
Uh, but again, it's the kind of thing that requires a clear commitment. Sure. Um, and then once they're, they feel like you know, they want to jump in, you know, we can give them all of the material mm -hmm. and then they could move forward with it and we'd be happy to see what would happen. That's great. That's great. So with, um, with so much in the world of disaster preparedness that we've done a lot of work in, right, with preparedness, you kind of prepare for this thing that may or may not ever happen. Um, I wonder if you talk a little bit more about uh, some, of the, some of the things that do happen with this program. I know you talked about some of the benefits to the people involved in their education and to their own community. Even if a disaster doesn't strike, what are some of the positive mm -hmm. things that come out of this? So I would say that, uh, number one, at an individual level, the students um, not only gain a lot of those skills that we were talking about before, mm -hmm. but they learn often very tangibly how to prepare for a disaster and then what it would take for them you know, to maybe help their families, their neighbors, communities. So they, they feel like they are personally a little bit uh, more prepared and mm -hmm. are ready mm -hmm. should something happen. Um, it then tends to have sort of a larger effect like, uh, you know, the cascading uh, effect of dropping a pebble in a lake and watching those concentric circles go out because then uh, as a group they, they feel like they are mm -hmm. more prepared. Um, and then a lot of times their teacher and their community partners with whom they're working also begin to understand mm -hmm. how they can be more prepared. Um, I think there's another interesting facet to this that we had not really anticipated when we started and we watched it happen in, in at least one school in particular, which is it's not just about disasters. Mm -hmm. It could be about many things that occur in the lives of children and youth that are stressors to them. And so, for example, in one of our high schools in Gulfport, Mississippi, um, there was an unfortunate situation with a, um, a, a shooting, uh, mm -hmm. shooting death mm -hmm. of a youth mm -hmm. in their high school. Mm -hmm. And the Shoreline chapter, on their own, because they had already learned how to organize themselves, within four days' time, organized a community-wide memorial service for the family mm -hmm. and the school and the community using their own, those very skills that we were teaching them uh -huh. to be a shoreline chapter. And so they took that and they applied it in situations above and beyond the conventional disaster. But, you know, that's such a great point. And in, so much in this field of resilience, right, we're finding out that, that the act of preparing for disasters can lead to just greater community engagement and greater civic involvement in ways that really benefit benefit the community in ways that, uh, that maybe we never even intended, and certainly to, to work with the youth. Uh, to to play some long ball on that to really you mm -hmm. know look to the future and, and prepare the next generation. Um, so one question that I would have. So if I'm a teacher or I, I run an after school program or or and I have to go to an administrator and I have to say, you know, I'm really interested in this program. This is something I really want to do. What and I have to justify within the limited scope and limited resources. How would you? What advice would you give to someone looking uh, who's really interested right. in this and trying to? fit it in with everything else. Right, and so we've obviously been in this position of selling the program every time we go to another school and talking to another principal and getting them engaged. And what we have found, um, not universally, but you know, in this, particularly in those schools where there's receptivity to it, is that the principals, the school leadership and administration is very, very interested in some of the aspects of this. Mm -hmm. They want to see uh, resilient students broadly. Mm -hmm. that, that short list I showed before of the resilience short list of mm -hmm. self-efficacy, coping, adaptation, um, pro-social behavior, those are very much the things that almost all principals, if not all of them, would like their students to have mm -hmm. when they graduate. Um, what happens to be an interesting time is that uh, there's a lot of curricular innovation that's happening in schools mm -hmm. as well. And a lot of principals have seen this and they've recognized that they can adapt, you know, the kinds of things that they want to do with STEM curriculum, for example. They, mm -hmm. they want to do something on environmental science and they realize this could be a terrific opportunity to get the, the youth, their students involved in a project and to learn through the course of doing the project about whatever the particular topical mm -hmm. area is. They could be learning science, they could be learning math, mm -hmm. they could be learning environmental sciences, they could be learning all of those things together. So Yeah. No, that 
that that's great, and, and I think with the data that you have now, there are so many different ways to sort of talk about this program. You mm -hmm. can talk about it from disaster preparedness, you can talk about it from youth development and community engagement and civic engagement. So what would you say in the various programs that you've seen done, what are the intangibles? What's the secret sauce to really making it successful? You gotta, you gotta get the cool kids involved, you have to, you have to bring snacks. What are some of those things you see that are maybe outside of, outside of the formula that you see are really helpful for, yes. uh, for the success of these programs? Snacks. Snacks. Food. Food is always good. On that good. note, I've got some. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say the the first and maybe most in critical piece is finding a teacher advisor, a teacher sponsor, mm -hmm. who is willing to believe in the youth and mm -hmm. and can have um, enough uh, confidence to step back and yeah. let the youth and let the students do it on their own, because that is really where they're going to have the greatest effect. Mm -hmm. They can be, they can guide them, but the whole premise is that having youth figure these things out for themselves mm -hmm. is really where the greatest gains occur. Mm -hmm. So to me, that would be the secret sauce and not any particular type of student. We have seen vastly different types of students. Some, in fact, we, we've invited the teachers and the principals in some schools to identify those kids that are very quiet or who just don't seem to, you know, have have caught on in any other place and mm -hmm. say, give them a chance because that's, you know, some of it, that's, you know, that's what the Shoreline chapter will allow them to do is to find that piece within them that they can really aspire to, engage in, and then uh, develop an expertise in. So we have a wide range of students all different types of uh, skill levels come together yeah. and figure out how to, to work as a group. I, I do have to say one other thing, which is the students really do enjoy um, meeting students from other schools. It's okay. the thing they like best, is to see how others live. Okay. Uh, so when we had the New York City students with the Gulf Coast students, they were fascinated with you know, each other's cultures, how they talked, the whole bit. Uh, we've even had some projects that spanned both of them, where they made videos mm -hmm. that uh, we then intercut together so that you had the New York City students asking questions of the Gulf Coast students. They all created these little videos, and then they meshed That's it great. together as a mashup. Yeah. yeah. That's great. And I, I wish I'd had a program like this back when I was in high school back in the day. But, um, but it's great that these things are out there now and are out there for, for kids and that there's a lot of different ways that it can be it can be uh, absorbed into the community through mm -hmm. the schools, through after-school programs, through others. Um, so in terms of sustainability, programs that you've seen go on from more than one year into the next, what are some of the key challenges and, and resources and, and how have you seen folks been able to sustain this over the years? So, and you raise a really important question, especially when you realize, when we realize that many of these projects will extend over the span of one year and the students mm -hmm. become very engaged and they want to carry it forward. And so the first thing is, if you have mainly seniors, that's not going to work too sure. well. Um, we've tried to think about how to develop a Shoreline alumni let network, but we haven't yet gotten to that point. And so uh, we might encourage uh, anybody that's thinking about developing a shoreline chapter to think about what's you know where they want to enter into what age they want to broach this i mean we've invited schools to have you know multi grades participate so we'll have students from all the grades within it uh, one thing that uh, you know we showed today was the ben franklin high school in new orleans they all started essentially as freshmen and then they did three years and they, they created mm -hmm. essentially a little cohort that that uh, kept together across all of those years. I think one of the things that it's, it's also important to think about is how much is the local community willing to invest mm -hmm. in the students and in this shoreline project? Because there is a certain amount of financial investment mm -hmm. that would be required. If you want to send a team to the summit, mm -hmm. well, that's going to cost money. And you, know, you want the, the community to endorse and support and be boosters of this kind of activity as well. So it sounds like within our coalitions, if groups adopt this, that those connections that they're forming with emergency management and with other groups within the community and the school districts and the child care centers and just all these different sectors coming together, that that actually would be a key ingredient in being able to sustain this or, or really any other resilience program. Absolutely, okay. yes. 
We're, we're just about out of time. Um, as we close out, I just want to once again thank our guest, uh, for, uh, thank David for coming here and giving us this overview. Um, also thank all of you who watched today, the folks from the communities, anybody else out there who's engaged through this project. Um, thank the, the team here at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University's Earth Institute, the folks at Save the Children who are doing some amazing work helping to lead the community uh, efforts uh, on this project. Um, and, uh, you know, as we, um, as we close out, um, just uh, why don't you tell us one more time, David, where folks can go if they're interested in learning more about this program. Right. Well, they, number one, they could email us, and you have our email addresses, but you can also go to uh, uh, ncdp. Uh, dot, I think it's ncdp.shoreline.columbia.edu. If you search for Shoreline and NCDP, you'll find it that way. <laughs> Great. Thank goodness for search engines. Exactly. All right. All right. And on that note, once again to everyone, thank you. We hope this has been helpful, and we look forward to seeing you out there in the community.